This is Trepwire Week in Review for the week ending January 26, 2024. I'm Haley Keen with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Lonnie Hendry, Chief Product Officer, and Stephen Bushbaum, Research Director. This week, we saw jobless claims rebound, GDP come in hotter than expected, and corporate earnings continue to roll in. We still await tomorrow's PCE numbers, which could be the data point to watch for the markets. At the moment, it seems like we're still on a path to immaculate disinflation. Stephen, what is your take? Sure. So I've heard a lot of cute terms this week for the data that we've gotten from the immaculate disinflation, which I think we've used a few times. My personal favorite was the golden path. I think the more realistic description is the narrow path to the soft landing. So today's data was really interesting to me. We had some big components. So mainly it was GDP that we got, and that came in incredibly strong, largely driven by consumer spending. As part of that release, we also got a sneak peek at the price indices or the PCE that'll be released tomorrow. It's slightly different data points, but generally you can say, okay, well, there's a lot of overlap, or at least there is some overlap in these indices. We got strong GDP and lower price levels. So you'd think, well, if consumer spending strong and GDP was strong, our bond yield's gonna go higher. Or alternatively, with disinflation and lower price levels, our bond yield's going to go down. So this was just, it was a tug of war today between higher bond yields from strong consumer spending or lower, and ultimately we took a leg lower. So that tells me that bond investors, and part of this was also driven by what happened in Europe, but generally US investors are still saying, all right, we, we buy into the lower price levels and the Fed rate cut. But those expectations have come down dramatically. So we're at a very interesting point now with this narrow path or golden path. We've priced in rate cuts for March. It, about a month ago, it got as high as 70-something percent chance of a 25 basis point rate cut. That's come back down to 40-something percent today. You know, I, I question, will we get that rate cut? Does it really matter if we get it in March or May? At the end of the day, I, I step back from this and say, okay, fortunately, bond yields went lower. The curve inversion has come down to 19 or 20 basis points between the 2 and the 10. So things are still looking pretty good. So I guess the long-winded answer to immaculate disinflation, yes or no, I, I don't have any data to tell me otherwise. So is it every time you say immaculate disinflation, Stephen, I think of Franco Harris and the immaculate reception from the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, um, you know, that's an interesting... We've done a lot of this. We've had the imma immaculate disinflation. You mentioned a couple others. I think we had one segment where we were talking about irrational exuberance. So here at TREP, we have a pretty wide vocabulary to uh, discuss the certain market conditions. So just to follow up on, on just kind of where we're at, the, the earnings came in or they're starting to come in. And just to give some context there, Microsoft, which hadn't reported data, but as of Wednesday, clips the tr $3 trillion market cap uh, mark at one point. They were down below at the close on Wednesday. I haven't checked to see what it is today, but at the time that left Microsoft and Apple as only the two companies, the US-based companies to reach that $3 trillion threshold. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out as earnings continue to come in. Netflix has been a really big winner. They had really strong fourth quarter performance, saw stock shore 11% and gained north of 13 million subscribers. So I think Netflix is an interesting case study in the sense they've continuously raised rates, really took an aggressive position on the password sharing, and they've continued to see their stock price um, grow, their subscriber count grow, and their revenue. This most recent reporting climbed to 8.8 .8 billion, which beat estimates. So it's really a, a good story for Netflix. And then just the tech stocks, which have been getting beat up since you know 2022, have really rebounded. I don't think people probably understand or appreciate that as much as they should because the negative headlines with some of the tech companies from a CRE context has been that they've been downsizing their footprint. They've been paying lease termination fees. They've been doing all this stuff to, to take write-offs and, and all the negative stuff. But if you look at the what we're calling the Magnificent Seven, they're up an aggregate 117% since the lows in, in 2022. And then you you talked about some of the economic indicators, so I won't get into that. I think it's interesting though, there's there's kind of a consensus now of the soft landing or of the markets, you know, kind of just navigating their way through. I did see a tweet today from a former podcast guest, Danielle DiMartino Booth, who is going to be joining us next week on our podcast with Dan McNamara. And she actually posted that, I'll just read the tweet to you here, every state except Texas 
has rising unemployment rates based on data going back to 1976. Once rising unemployment includes 50 states, the U.S. has historically entered recession. So coming out of this very positive narrative that you you know eloquently walk through, Stephen, she's kind of taking a contrarian position saying, don't believe the hype. I think this one indicator uh, suggests that we're probably heading towards a recession. Yeah, I think uh, just piling on to that viewpoint, there was a, a really good narrative put out this week by Andrew Hollenhorst, who's uh, over at Citigroup. And he's certainly in, in the camp of, you know, not exactly writing the obituary on inflation, as, as one article put it. And so he pointed out that, as we mentioned last week, the Red Sea related trade disruptions and what that could mean for inflation are very concerning. And then when we look at the labor data here, if you dig into for the non-farm payrolls, what sectors we've seen still strong numbers being posted in, those were the sectors that were lagging coming out of COVID. So namely, we had uh, lodging, education, government, medical services. So you know, largely the gains have been isolated to those sectors. And if we look beyond that, it's it's sort of like, well, it feels like we're just in a holding pattern. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Daniel DiMartino Booth has to say about this next week, because she is very much an authority and digging through this data, I think, as well as anyone in the uh, the sector. Yeah, she'll definitely have a hot take. There's no doubt about that. Our podcast with her last time was probably one of our most listened to. And from being on that show with her, it was definitely one of the most fun to record. She uh, She definitely has her positions and backed by data. It's really interesting. Just two other quick points and we'll transition to the uh, property sectors. I did see some stuff around, John Burns had put out some stuff on home, home ownership rates. And this was kind of contra to the narrative too. He basically says home ownership has been growing in every age cohort. So even though there's affordability problems, people are figuring out ways to purchase homes. And so he had a chart out that just shows by age cohort how people are still buying homes and the, that percentage is increasing, which I think if you asked any of us or most anyone on the street, the narrative would be that homeownership has been on a decline and people are forced to be renters. And so it's interesting to see his perspective on that. And then just, you know, new home sales, we've seen a, a big uptick in the little bit of a rate reprieve we saw at the end of the year. So home builders are starting to see some some uptick in sales and you're starting to see some residential real estate markets really come to life that had been fairly tepid, you know, for most of 2023. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Jay's discussion tomorrow on our Market Pulse webinar about some of the residential dynamics, namely the, the trends we've been seeing in new home sales versus expectations around, you know, what's going to happen in the rental market, uh, whether that's single family rentals or the apartment market, and then even bifurcating further across the apartment market between you know, the higher end luxury or the lower end workforce or uh, more affordable end. You know, that'll be a really good discussion tomorrow. Yeah. So Stephen, tomorrow we will be hosting our Market Pulse webinar. So if you're an early listener of the podcast, you might still have time to sign up and attend that. But even if you're just interested in getting a playback, you can Send us an email to podcast.trep.com, register, and we'll send you the recording after. We'll have a lot of great content on there. We'll be talking about the multifamily and housing markets, our office expense series, some overview of our bank earnings and bank data, and just our take on what's been happening in CRE and the markets this month. So send us an email to podcast.trep.com. And now we'll turn to our commercial real estate segment. We'll try to get through a bunch of property types today, and we can start with our retail sector. First story up for the retail sector is we have a retail center in Tempe, Arizona, uh, sold for $22.2 million. Capstone Advisors was the buyer. They purchased a 39,000 square foot retail center property located at 421 through 501 South Mill Avenue. Uh, they purchased the property from a group of investors led by Cyrus and Nakissa Edamad in a deal arranged by JLL Capital Markets. The financing was provided by Mountain American Federal Credit Union, which provided $11.7 million loan to facilitate the purchase. So, you know, roughly just over 50% type of LTV scenario. Uh, this property was built in 1998. And again, as we've said, Stephen, for the last couple of months, just really strong indication of a desire for investors to continue to acquire retail centers. We had another Miami property this time that sold for $27.5 million. 
Interesting nugget on this one is a tenant in common investor group, uh, which we saw a lot of probably 15 years ago. You don't see a lot of those in today's market, but maybe uh, it's come making a comeback with some of the disruption. But uh, this group purchased 225,000 square foot Time Century Jewelry Center. This uh, property is located in downtown Miami. The sales price translates to about $122 a square foot. And that story comes to us from the South Florida Business Journal. So Time Century Holdings of New York, um, which is led by Yair Levy, sold the retail property here in Miami. The location of that asset is 1 Northeast 1st Street. Um, as we mentioned, it's 225,000 square feet, but it sits across five stories. It's built in 1926, and it served for collateral for $26 million worth of debt uh, provided by City National Bank of Florida. The buyer assumed the existing loan, which had been resized to $20 million, as part of the purchase. So this is another one. I think we had a story last week too, Stephen, where we had an assumption in play outside of the multifamily space. So you're starting to see people get creative to make some of these deals happen. And then I'll finish up with two more and then you can jump in here. Grocery Anchor Retail Property in New Hampshire sells for 16.6 million. This was a transaction uh, done by an affiliate of Capital Group Properties, which purchased the property for about $202 a square foot, the asset is Merrimack Village Center, a roughly 82,300 square foot retail property in Merrimack, New Hampshire. And so this center was built in 2006, is fully leased and anchored by a Shaw's grocery store, which occupies uh, 54,000 square feet. So obviously they don't lease the entire center, but the center is fully occupied with the major anchor tenant occupying about 54,000 square feet. And then lastly, KS Retail Property uh, sold for $40 million. This was a venture of Lormac Stern and Time Equities. Uh, they paid the $40 million, or about $115 a, a square foot, for Oak Park Commons, 350,000 square foot retail property in Lenexa, Kansas. They purchased the property from DRA Advisors, which has been in the headlines for a lot of transaction activity over the last couple of weeks. This uh, deal was brokered by Mid-America Real Estate Corp., and the acquisition was funded with a $27 million loan from Sokchen. Was built in multiple phases, first starting in 1986, and then later in 1992, properties located at 12120 West 95th Street, about 15 miles south of Kansas City. Currently sits at about 88% occupancy. Largest tenants are Hobby Lobby, which takes 63,000 square feet. They have a lease that runs through July of 25. Ross Dress for Less, which uh, occupies 25,000 square feet. Their lease runs until 2030. And Petco, with 22,000 square feet, that has a lease that's uh, scheduled to roll in March, but all indications are that they're going to extend for another three years. This property had NOI of 3.86 million during the last 12 months uh, through September of 2023, which would put the purchase at about a 9.65 cap rate on today's purchase price. So another retail story anchored by Hobby Lobby, Ross Dress for Less, and uh, Petco. Different week, same outcome, Stephen. Yeah, and if, just looking at the uh, the financing numbers here that we had for a couple of those stories, it was interesting to see how high the leverage points were in a couple of those. That last one that you you covered, that uh, LTV would have been 67.5%. And the tenant in common that was, I guess, two stories back that had the loan assumption, that pay down still would have put the loan to value at, uh, let's just round it up and call it 73%. So I mean, those are healthy leverage points. I mean, that tells me that you know, while lenders still are probably getting uh, to, to dictate terms and getting some relatively good deals, it's, that's good to see the leverage points being underwritten at, at that high. I mean, we don't want to get too far over skis, but again, to think about this objectively, stepping back from the data, what that's telling me is, you know, maybe for certain sectors, we really are reaching that uh, inflection point where current cap rates are reaching that that trough of the market and your exit cap is is really what uh, some of us are banking on here. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, Stephen. Like, I agree with you. The assumption one, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, but it's really kind of atypical, 70% on assumption. You know, looking back at the at the story, it's in Miami, so maybe there's some other things there. Um, it's a it's a fairly large center, two hundred twenty five thousand square feet. But if you look at the purchase price, one hundred twenty two dollars a square foot. All things considered, that's a really low purchase price number. So 
it, it just makes me think that was the 27 and a half million really representative of the full market value or were there other consideration in play here where the buyer was able to come in, rescue the current owner, let them get out unscathed, assume the loan, and really the property has a value something north of 30 million, which would, would make a little bit more sense. I agree. Yeah, there's only so much detail we can get on some of these stories, and ultimately we get more color as, as time goes on. So bottom line, some, some encouraging prints here. So let's turn our attention to the multifamily segment. First up, we have uh, Charlotte, North Carolina Apartments selling for $38.6 million. We have Claremont has paid $38.6 million, or roughly $225,000 a unit, for the 171-unit Giddy Hall apartment property at 10951 Netherly Drive in Charlotte, North Carolina, according to the Charlotte Business Journal. The Bridgewater, Massachusetts company purchased the complex from a venture of Mission Properties and Chaucer Creek Capital. Cushman and Wakefield brokered the sale and arranged acquisition financing, terms of which were not disclosed. Giddy Hall, built in 2022, has a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units, includes a swimming pool, fitness center, clubhouse, and playground. Up next, we have Dallas Apartments facing foreclosure. Aries Commercial Real Estate has filed a foreclose against the $127 million loan it holds against the 378-unit Gabriella Apartment property at 770 Cantergrawl Street in Dallas. The New York lender provided the loan to the developer Graystar Real Estate Partners of Charleston. The property opened in 2020. A foreclosure auction has been scheduled for February 6th. Gabriela has studio, one, two, and three bedroom units, and the property includes a swimming pool, fitness center, business center, clubhouse, conference rooms, and other amenities. Up next, we have FPA pays $60.5 million for Seattle area apartments. So FBI, FPA has paid $60.5 million or $201,000 per unit for Atrium on James, a 300-unit apartment property in Kent, Washington. The San Francisco investment manager purchased the property from Open House Westwood LLC of Los Angeles in a deal brokered by Marcus and Milchap Institutional Property Advisors Unit. It made its investment through FPA Opportunity Fund 8, through which the company had raised $1.45 billion of equity commitments in 2022. Atrium on James at 6248 South 242nd Place was built in 1989 and has been renamed Renew on James. It has one, two, and three bedroom units with monthly rents starting at $15.50 per month. And then finally, we have Brookfield Ballast bought debt on San Francisco apartments for 89% of par. So this was a big one. I mean, this was a huge one, actually. The venture between Brookfield Corp and Ballast Investment bought the 451 0.12 million of CMBS loans against 62 apartment properties with 1,734 units in San Francisco that had been owned by Veritas Investments paid 402 spot 21 million or 89% of principal balance for the loans. So to say that again, they paid 89 cents for every dollar of Veritas loans they were buying here. So Ballast of San Francisco had struck a deal last August to buy these loans along with another 500 million of indebtedness against what were 95 properties with roughly 2,400 units that Veritas, also San Francisco, had owned. Ballast brought in Brookfield as its capital partner and completed its purchase in recent weeks. The venture evidently has begun taking title to the collateral uh, properties. So they went ahead and proceeded with the auction and foreclosed to wipe title clean uh, and ultimately just get the ball rolling on their, their strategy here. Uh, Veritas took title of the properties in 2011, also buying troubled debt against them. So this is now two rounds of the same portfolio having troubled debt and somebody buying it out. So this is now its, its second go around the distressed debt table. So it did that with a venture with a Baupost Group and the properties were previously owned by Limby Group. That, that name brings me back. The Limby portfolio was something we talked about a lot uh, back in the GFC. So it's Funny to see this, this loan making headlines again. Um, just one more detail to throw out about this. When these loans were liquidated in the January remit data that we got, uh, there was a very, very substantial amount of funds held back. It was roughly $200 million in servicer advances, expenses, or other fees that were held back. So it pushed the loss to the CMBS trust on this to, I think it was 50 or 56% loss on these loans. We're still waiting to get some clarity there because we've been going back and forth, scratching our heads about the, the amount of advances that we saw in the data. 
versus a lot of times you don't see all of the expenses, advances or other fees uh, reconciled that first month. So we'll probably have some follow-up on this loan. Yeah, I think this is a story that's going to keep on giving, Stephen. I mean, like we've been talking about this one for some time. And it's interesting as you talk about the Limby Group and this asset, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And this is kind of one of those scenarios where you look at this asset and it's been effectively in this perpetual state of distress for a very long time. I know on a previous podcast episode, we talked about there might have been some silver lining here, at least for the ownership group of having rate caps in place that they were able to sell, or there was some like kind of nuanced thing that might have helped them some have some in the money position. But for the bondholders here, it doesn't look great. And as you mentioned, we'll follow up on that as the data becomes more readily available. I did want to circle back through the two other two of the other stories. Um, on the Dallas apartment, um, the Aries commercial real estate they followed a foreclosure on. You know, you and I are both uh, residing at some point in Texas and being familiar with that process. Like Texas allows for non-judicial foreclosure. So that process is very quick. So in Texas, in order to foreclose, literally the borrower has to be 120 days or so delinquent on the mortgage. The lender can then take action post notice, wait 21 days and effectively schedule a foreclosure auction. And in this case, as you mentioned, it's February 6th. So I don't know if you've ever gone to any of those auctions or whatever, but for those that are maybe not familiar with the non-judicial foreclosure process, effectively you show up at the courthouse and they literally auction the property off like old school auction style. And so that's what will happen here. And effectively the high bid will take the property. It's not uncommon for the lender to be the high bid um, or if there's no bids for a lender to take it back. But you can literally show up at any of the Texas courthouses um, on the day of the auctions, and you'll see a large group of people standing out there trying to buy some uh, some foreclosure deals at a, at, a, at a reduced basis. So it'll be interesting to see what happens here. Maybe they get something worked out before the February 6th deadline. If not, it'll uh, be auctioned off at the courthouse. You know, that reminds me, uh, when I was a professor and shoot, even going back to when I was uh, a teaching assistant, one of the fantastic extra credit opportunities. So listen up, any university students out there that are just starting in the spring semester. If you're in a non-judicial foreclosure state and you're looking for extra credit, toss the idea out to your professor and say, hey, if I go to a foreclosure auction and take some detailed notes, you know, could I maybe be uh, eligible for some extra credit here? Because it is a, a very good educational experience. Yeah, I've actually made that an assignment in some of my classes, not even extra credit, but I think I might be a, a little more hardcore than than Steven. He's he's like uh, the player's coach. I'm a little bit more uh, hardcore. And then on the uh, on the FPA deal that you talked about in Seattle, Stephen, I think this is an interesting one with some takeaways. You mentioned the investment was through the FPA Opportunity Fund, and we've heard a lot in the news and a lot of the headlines around all this distressed debt or funds that were raised to come in and buy deals. And they really haven't placed capital or, or made acquisitions at a pace that people expected in 21 and 22. Um, and so it's interesting to see this was a you know almost a $1.5 billion worth of equity commitments and to see them start taking properties down. And I think that resonates given what we heard coming out of Cref C, where people were saying a lot of people are coming up on fund deadlines or they have obligations to place place funds in the market. And that by itself is going to increase transaction activity. So it's it's interesting to see three weeks into 24 that we already have a pretty nice story here, $60 million acquisition up in Seattle. And another shameless plug for the webinar tomorrow. We'll probably talk a little bit about uh, the fund phenomenon and some of the pressures and uh, just considerations in that space. So I don't want to spoil a surprise, but yes, this will be something we'll be digging into a little bit more tomorrow. So moving on to our office segment, as we've been talking about for a long time now, vacancy rates at the national level are at record highs. Rents at many properties are flat and demand has been dull. And as a result, revenue has been hit. And in some markets, it declined in 2022. We also looked at, and we wrote a report and a series of reports on this, office properties that are also faced with increasing operating expenses. So we saw that in 2022, and we likely saw that in 2023. So Stephen, can you break down some of the findings? Sure. So the uh, next two reports that will be released will be a deep dive on taxes and insurance. So what we did was we aggregated up at the MSA level what we saw for year-over-year -year changes for these 
expense categories. So looking first at taxes, we saw some, some pretty I don't want to say sizable, but decent increases across a couple of MSAs. So Nashville topped our list here for largest year-over-year -year increases in real estate taxes coming in at about 11%. So we have some very, very good metro-specific commentary in this report. Um, I don't want to go through it now. If you're interested, please absolutely reach out to podcast at trep.com because uh, the MSA-level insights that we use to explain uh, these increases or the uh, trends that we're seeing are, are I think, very worthwhile. I uh, want to touch on the insurance one just briefly, because this is something, Lonnie, you and I have talked about ad nauseum. Well, I shouldn't say ad nauseum because we're going to continue talking about it. Um, I haven't thrown up yet. Some of the insurance expenses that we're seeing at the MSA level are eye-watering. And this is just a one-year increase. So I think New Orleans uh, has topped you know, now two property sectors for us, multifamily, which is the first expense series we did. And now in office, they were the, the second highest insurance year-over-year uh, -year increase with, I'm going to round this up to 32% increase in your property insurance cost on a per square foot basis at the metro level. Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, Ventura, California, MSA actually took the top spot at 32.2%. Probably not a big surprise here given the number of natural disaster events that you've, you've seen there from flooding, mudslides, earthquakes, uh, snowfall, wildfires. It's just, it's unabating uh, in the, the weather threats that they face over there. And that obviously is going to play into the insurance rates. If you're interested in getting these reports, please reach out to us at podcast at trep.com uh, and we will put you on the distribution list for these. Yeah, this is going to be a great series. We had really good feedback on the multifamily and we're using the same template on the office sector. And to your point, Stephen, when I saw the office insurance numbers, it, it kind of struck me as higher than I thought. Like multifamily, as an example, Miami MSA had the highest uh, insurance year over year increase, and it was just over 28%. And I think we had two or three MSAs in the office sector that were at 30% or higher. So it's just, I didn't imagine it being as high on the office sector for some reason. Um, but to your point, like we're not going to stop talking about this. Like this is only going to become a bigger talking point as these disasters and as insurers face the, I mean, I saw a state farm, they posted their earnings and it was a huge loss in the billions. That does not bode well for the, the CRE sector. I'm flying out to San Diego on Monday and I was watching flood videos yesterday of, you know, them getting rain and the city being flooded out. So this is a great series. You should definitely request a copy of the report. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, we'll be sending out multiple versions of this as we go down the operating statement, look at each individual or the main individual line item expenses. So yeah, more to come on this over the coming weeks. And sticking on the office theme, we have a bunch of stories that we want to break down today. First up, we have Wildwood Center in Atlanta transferred to the Special Servicer. According to January remit data, the 62.9 million Wildwood Center loan was transferred to the Special Servicer. The collateral at 2300 Windy Ridge Parkway Southeast in Atlanta is nearly 700,000 square feet in office space that was built in 1987. Last year, we noted that Prima, Prima, under the name DS Services of America, was looking to sublease its space at the property. The firm is the second largest tenant with 8.42% of the space on a lease that ends in late 2025. The lease of the largest tenants with 32 spot 1% of space expires around that same time. The Wildwood Center also makes up about 21% of a 2013 deal. So this is a very meaningful uh, transfer. Over the first nine months of 2023, the amortizing loan posted a debt service coverage ratio based on net cash flow of one spot 1.5 when occupancy was 88%. Quickly, Stephen, on this one, I know you have roots in Atlanta. I'm always surprised that the Atlanta office market has never reached like the pinnacle of some of the, the other big cities. Like if you drive through there, it seems like they have a really solid tenant roster. They have really nice buildings. They have a huge, you know, fast paced airport flights in and out all day, every day to everywhere. You know, obviously every market struggling in the office sector now, but I mean, do you have any thoughts behind maybe why Atlanta just doesn't get the notoriety that some of these other large office markets get? 
You know, part of this, and, and this was a joke, a long running joke we had uh, when we were underwriting office across various markets, we always joked that, well, Atlanta is just perpetually 20% vacant, you know, 15, 20% vacant. You have a lot of developable land, so it's just easy to add supply. At the first sign of tightness, you have a bunch of developers go into break ground. So layer on top of that, a bit of a fragmented market, high commuting costs. It's, it's a tricky office market to do well in. It's not to say anybody doesn't do well there. I mean, there's some people that absolutely knock it out of the park because you have so many Fortune 500 companies in, in that market, to your point, Lonnie. It's a tricky one. You know, we've had plenty of office stories in this metro over time, and it's not like it's uh, the distress or success stories are limited to one particular submarket. It really varies from whether it's the downtown, midtown, Buckhead, the North Perimeter, Roswell area, Alpharetta. You know, each of these markets has its its nuances, its idiosyncrasies. So it's it's just a very difficult one if you're trying to be a generalist and you're an out of town player. Uh, it's it's certainly one where you want to make sure you're you're very thorough. Yeah, that makes sense because it is like if you drive down the highway, they have some really large corporate logos hanging in the buildings, and so it's I appreciate the uh, the response uh, there because it it's one that just doesn't make a lot of sense unless you know some of that nuance um, exists there. I, it's interesting on the Sun Belt, just in general. Like, there's a lot of developable land across the Sun Belt, so it's it's kind of been, I don't know, interesting for me on the multifamily sector. You know, shifting gears a little bit here, just to say, some of these cap rates and stuff that people pay for these assets, when literally you could go a couple miles down the road and build a newer, more amenitized property, minimal pushback from a zoning perspective or from a, a permitting perspective. So I guess we'll just have to keep an eye on Atlanta. It's it's definitely on the radar of having a lot of criticized or distressed loans, um, and so hopefully they can they can push through. But twenty percent vacancy, if that's the standard or stabilized vacancy, that's uh, that's a problem. So next up, we have the value reduced for sixteen seventy Broadway. According to January remit data, the value of the collateral behind the sixteen seventy Broadway loan has been reduced. The November twenty twenty three appraised value was lowered to one hundred thirty one point one million. So that's down forty five percent from the two hundred thirty nine point five million appraised value in twenty eighteen. The collateral is a seven hundred nine thousand square foot office in Denver, Colorado. TIA is the top tenant with thirty two spot eight percent of the space base on a lease that ends in 2029. Financial performance for the loan has been strong with a debt service coverage ratio based on that cash flow of 2 spot 09 or higher since 2018. For third quarter 2023, that number was 4 spot 3 when occupancy was 82%. The fact that the loan was not refinanced underscores the difficulty many office landlords are currently facing. Of the top five tenants, three have lease expirations in 2026 and one is in 2028. The senior CMBS loan was structured with an LTV of 33%, but there's also a MES loan of 64.8 million. Uh, special servicer notes state that the lender has given the borrower a proposal for extending the loan. So this will be one that we'll be keeping on. Hopefully we'll get some, some good news and this will eventually get probably an extension. And with cash flow numbers like that, we do start seeing thawing in capital markets Lonnie, I'm curious what your thoughts are, but I, I think this is certainly one where we could see a, a good resolution down the road. Yeah, I agree. I think this is one, though, that's interesting as you kind of go through the numbers. You see the headline LTV of 33% on the senior note. You're like, oh, this is nice. And then you have that baggage called the MES loan sitting out there at about $65 million. It's like not so nice. But generally speaking, I think this is one that probably gets something you know, some sort of resolution at some point. This is another story on Broadway. We've had a couple of those over the last couple of days, similar type of value um, decline. And um, this one here, at least to this point, doesn't have such a, a negative connotation as the one we talked about last week. So next up, we have a Rio Cleveland office to lose its largest tenant. The largest tenant at 1100 Superior Avenue, the Oswald Company, will be moving to the e &Y Tower upon their lease expiration, according to Commercial Real Estate Direct. The lease expiration for the Oswald company is July 2025. The company currently occupies almost 101,000 square feet or 17.5% of 1100 Superior Avenue. This would be another damaging blow to the property. In June 2023, we noted that the second largest tenant at the property, Brand Muscle, who leased 9.7% of space, would be vacating when their lease ended in August 23. The asset makes up 5.9% of the remaining collateral behind a 2014 deal. 
The property is a 576,000 square foot office in Cleveland. That office was built in 1972, renovated in 2013, and became REO early in 2023. At securitization, the collateral was valued at 70 million, but that has since been lowered a few times and most recently was reported at 26 million. And that was before the release of the October servicer data. Uh, the value was lowered to 16.7 million in October 23, based on an appraisal conducted in August of 23. So I should mention this ties or is related to another story we had about the ENY Tower was going to be renamed Oswald Tower. Uh, so when Oswald made that move to the ENY Tower in Cleveland, they also got naming rights to the building. So what was a negative for 1100 Superior is tied to a bit of good news for the ENY Tower. Yeah, this is not great news. So I mean, looking no. at this, the diminution in the praise value, 70 million, 26 million, 16.7 million. I mean, I'm not familiar with Cleveland land values. They're probably not at that 16.7 million range, but this kind of begs the question at some point, does this asset get reduced to a point where it effectively is land value? You know, I think that's, this is one to keep an eye on. It's a, it's a significant reduction. And, you know, it's an old, this is exactly what we've talked about. It's just an old obsolete building built in 72, half a million plus square feet, even though it was renovated in 2013. I'm assuming it's probably just a tired office building in a location that has proven to not, you know, really muster up a bunch of uh, excitement for tenants to relocate there. Sure. And if I'm putting on my tenant rep hat, you know, when a building goes or when a property goes REO and it starts being maintained by the lender or special servicer, some of those lease negotiations end up a lot of times having a different outcome than what they would have had if this was, you know, the, the highest, their highest and best hands holding this asset, you know, an investor. Because I think, you know, Lonnie, you can speak to this maybe a little bit better than me. Tenants get a little bit concerned about their well-being when this, when these assets go REO or in foreclosure. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, we talk with a bunch of tenant reps, you know, as part of our job. And it's definitely top of mind for tenants to know, like, what is the health of the sponsor when they're entering into a lease? Like, it's not favorable if the borrower is about to be pushed out and these assets are going to be managed by some, you know, third party that maybe doesn't understand the marketplace and is really there to try to just oversee the transaction and not to maximize the tenant experience. So I think we're going to see more and more of that becoming top of mind. It, it, it hasn't been an issue, but now um, tenants are certainly inquisitive about what the current status of their, their ownership structure is. So up next, we have Princess Cruises offering a big chunk of office space for sublease in Santa Clarita. So Princess Cruises is offering 289,000 square feet of office for sublease at Valencia Town Center, a 395,000 square foot property in Santa Clarita, California, that serves at, as the company's headquarters, according to The Real Deal. The cruise line's lease runs through March 2026. The Real Deal reports the cruise line has set the sublease rent at $199 per square foot per month or $2388 per square foot per year. And that includes the base rent, OPEX, janitorial services, and utilities. So to put that in context, the underwritten base rent for the Princess Cruises leased space in 2018 was 27 spot 18. So taking a little bit of hit there to try and clear this space. The collateral consists of four Class A office buildings totaling 395,000 square feet and two parking structures within the Greater Valencia Town Center mixed-use development that contains indoor and outdoor shopping, dining, and entertainment establish establishments covering over 1 million square feet of retail space in Santa Clarita. The Valencia Town Center office buildings were built between 95 and 2000. Princess Cruises is the largest tenant at that property uh, that addresses at 24,300, 24303 and 24305 Town Center Drive and 24200 Magic Mountain Parkway, taking 73% of space across the buildings. The $53.8 million Valencia Town Center loan makes up 6.15% of a 2018 deal. And over the first nine months of 2023, the loan posted a debt service coverage ratio based on that cash flow of 2 spot 08 when occupancy was 88%. Yeah, that that uh, that service coverage is coming down after these folks vacate, and you know, imagine imagine this: you uh, you're an office worker at Princess Cruises, 
you get an email on Thursday before the Trepwire podcast, and it says, hey, we've decided to put up our space for sublease. You need to report to cruise ship number two. We're going to move your office to the uh, to the cruise line. We're going to save save money, and we're moving all of our staff to different cruise ships, and uh, you'll be working remote for the next few few months. I don't know how I feel about that. And obviously, they didn't say they're doing that, but I wouldn't put it past some of these guys. I mean, random question for you here, Lonnie. Would the uh, the insurance that you'd run on a, a per cubicle basis be lower for a cruise ship than uh, perhaps some of the California markets that have been hit by so many natural disasters? Yeah, I mean, I think if you... I mean, I don't know. Like, there's some stories I read today about people getting sick on a carnival cruise recently. So it seems like the uh, the instance of employees being out sick or having too much to drink uh, might run high. I will say when I was in Miami a couple of weeks ago, it was the icon of the seas was porting for the first time. And people were like stopping on the highway, taking pictures and stuff. And like my Uber driver was telling me like that was such a huge deal because it's such a big ship. And then I've seen like probably 500 commercials for it on TV. Um, but it is crazy. It has like a golf course. It has a water park. It has like all this stuff. Like, I don't know. I don't see the appeal, but I definitely wouldn't want to work on one either. <laughs> it's a very good point. I mean, me personally, I hear about norovirus on those things and Coming from somebody who's had norovirus multiple times and ended up in the ER with it, uh, I I might be a little bit gun shy myself. So let's uh, we're going to finish up on the stories for office with that last uh, topic. But I wanted to highlight for the listeners that if you haven't signed up for our daily newsletter called the, the Rundown, which is an extension of the podcast, written and put together by the team that helped put together the podcast, you're missing out on a lot of stories. We probably have another ten or twelve office transaction stories that we'd love to get to on today's episode, but the time just doesn't allow. But if you were a subscriber, then you would have these stories in your inbox uh, delivered to you every morning. So uh, if you haven't signed up for that, email us at podcast at trep.com and uh, we'll make sure we get you the link so that you can sign up for that newsletter. And lastly, we can talk about some hotel stories very quickly to end the pod. Yeah, so I was going to jump in here, Haley. It's been a while since we've had some lodging stories. We talked last week about some of the construction costs from uh, one of the reports that was put out. We have a couple of transactions here. So San Francisco Hotel is being offered for sale. We have uh, FR Holdings. They have a 113-room Hotel Whitcomb in San Francisco. Uh, New York companies hired East Deal Secure to market the property, currently asking $75 million for the asset. That's according to a story, story by The Real Deal. RFR had purchased the property in 2018 for $130 million, had taken out a $114 million loan from Blackstone Group for the purchase. So this is another one of those that doesn't look good on the books. Paid $130 and $18, taking it to market at $75, probably won't sell for the whisper price of $75. You're going to end up at something less and the current mortgage on the asset, at least at origination, had a balance of $113 million. Two other quickly... Magnolia Hotel in Denver uh, transferred to special servicing. This is according to most recent January remittance. $48 million Magnolia Hotel loan was transferred to the special servicer. The collateral is a 297 key hotel in Denver, was built in 2011 and renovated in 2016. I think we're starting to see a theme here, Stephen, on some of these hotels. The renovation dates on these, they used to have PIP plans in place every five or seven years. And a lot of these in COVID when they would have been getting updated, just didn't get that cycle. And then they haven't been able to renovate because of occupancy or revenue challenges. So this one was renovated in 2016, we're in 2024. That's pretty long in the tooth. Uh, this property had a loan that was slated to mature in May of 22, which was extended until May of 2024. This, this deal split across two CMBS deals. Uh, this is just one of those stories where you know, there's there's going to be some distress. This is a tired hotel in a market that expects and demands in Denver to have stuff that's renovated and nice. And I think they're going to have some challenges there. And then lastly, Lake of the Ozarks Hotel uh, took, takes out a $60.5 million loan. So Goldman Sachs and Starwood Mortgage Capital have provided a $60.5 million mortgage on the 520-room Margaritaville Lake of the Ozarks Hotel. Um, in Missouri. This loan allowed for recapitalization of the property, which was formerly known as the Tan Tar A Resort at 494 Tan Tar A Drive along the Lake of the Ozarks. Venture between Driftwood Capital, Coral Gables, 
and Sapphira Capital of Miami had acquired the property in 2017 for $32.6 million. Uh, that transaction was from a CMBS trust that held it at the time. The loan in place was at $42.23 million. The resort had been taken by the trust through foreclosure. So this is not an auction type of foreclosure we had mentioned earlier. As a result, property, which was constructed in 1960, was in a state of disrepair. The acquirers, Driftwood, Sapphira, invested an estimated $27 million in upgrades, allowing the rebranding to a Margaritaville property. Um, Bercadia South Florida office was who arranged the financing on behalf of um, Goldman Sachs and Starwood Mortgage. And the property has been sitting at about 55% occupancy for the last 12 months. That was according to data through October of 23, generated an ADR or an average daily um, room rate of $166. And then the revenue per available room or RevPAR was at $90 and about 50 cents, um, which was well um, outside of the, the comp set for market competitors. Yeah, just real quick on this one, I was looking through the occupancy trends because this had a, this was such a positive story to read. You know, they bought this hotel in a state of disrepair, invested a lot of capital in it, rebranded it, uh, and really repositioned it strongly. When I was looking through the occupancy, you know, this did take a hit during COVID, but sh other than a, a two month blip in the payment stream, I mean, this thing came roaring back post COVID, and I think speaks to the strength of some of these lifestyle type resort properties doing extremely well. You know, on a related note, Lenny, I think maybe you saw this this article as well, talking about uh, hotel strategy for Gen Z. You know, basically offering up uh, certain amenity sets to try and appeal to uh, different generations, and really, you know, I think take a, a different spin on what it means to be. I don't want to say full service, but um, the type of offerings that you have in, in lodging. Yeah, you're seeing that across a bunch of different um, sectors where they're changing kind of the appeal. I mean, retail has gone to more experiential. And I think you're going to see with office much more of a hotel feel to the office sector. And even within the hotel space, you're going to see amenities and other things targeted towards their travel segment, whether it be leisure or business, and then broken down even further by age or demographic or whatever to try to get people to their to their location. So very interesting time. This is where, you know, the operational side of that business becomes uh, very impactful to the performance. Yep. And creativity is, is rewarded. Okay. And turning to shout outs for the week, Eileen G and Amy B reached out. They are weekly listeners of the pod and they love it. They said they always look forward to our CRE commentary and perspectives, which help them stay fresh and up to date on market trends. We had a bunch of people reach out for access to the newsletter and our webinars. So Jake M, Alex W, Joel R, Derek B, Richard K, Adam T, Michael S, and Bradley B. And then a few others. Carl M enjoys our podcast and said he won't go on the treadmill without it. So that's some good motivation, Carl. Sean K said we have a great show. He thanks us for keeping him informed. Richard B loves the pod. Anthony G is a huge fan. Austin E firstly wanted to give a shout out and say thank you for the podcast. He's in the Siri investment sales game in Kentucky. And he said the podcast has been great all around. Garrett J thoroughly enjoys the podcast and appreciates us for putting together an informative yet entertaining program. Chen Ching F enjoys listening to the podcast. And Oscar D loves Tripwire's Thursday podcast and has just signed up for the rundown. So thank you to everyone who reached out this week. Yeah, I have a couple this week too, Haley. I just uh, was able to participate in an event with uh, an organization that we help support, uh, FIVA. It's a, it's a forum and, and membership group of uh, appraisers in the industry, mostly bank appraisers. And I was fortunate enough to present with them today. And we had several people put in the chat that they were fans of the Trepwire podcast. So we love uh Hearing that, reading that, seeing that. So thank you for the continued support and I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. And then yesterday I was fortunate enough to present on my very first, I guess, X spaces is what they call it now, but Twitter spaces with Tracy from Chicago. She had set up a Twitter spaces uh, between myself and Dan McNamara. And we really just did a deep dive on the CRE market and provided some perspective on what we think is happening with distress, where there's opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to say, Haley can vouch for this. I was really kind of nervous heading into that because I'd never done a spaces before. I'm used to 
I have my mic set up, my headphones set up. Like I'm, I'm ready. You guys can't see us because we don't have the video stuff yet, but like look like a helicopter pilot on these things. I'm ready. And I was reading online that on the Twitter spaces, you could only do it from your phone. So I was like, how am I going to get my microphone set up with that? Oh, I'm not going to get my microphone set up with that. So then I'm like making sure my AirPods are tight, charged up, ready. Haley was telling me, take a deep breath. It's pretty simple. You just got to click the button. <laughs> and luckily enough, it was simple and it went off without a hitch. So I had a good time with that and I uh, appreciate people uh, listening to that and giving us some shout outs on, uh, on Twitter as well. Yeah. If anyone's big on X, I'll call it, but it's really Twitter. Follow us at Tripwire and tweet us when you're listening or send us a picture. If you have a podcast t-shirt, we'd love to see what you guys are doing. And we, we also put out a kind of general call to action a few weeks ago saying that Trep's always expanding. We're always looking to add people to the team and just see who's out there. And a bunch of you guys have already sent us resumes. So we'll be reading through those and getting back to you in the next few weeks or so. But just another plug. And I know, Lonnie, you might still have more opportunities out there and coming down the pipe. Yeah, so I just want to echo your sentiment there, Haley. If you sent the resume in, um, we're going through those, and we will be reaching out to some of you for sure. Um, and we are going to have some additional opportunities on our banking uh, team here at TREP coming down the pipeline. So if you uh, understand modeling, risks, analytics, um, regulatory environment, things like that, working at a bank, have experience with that, and have some interest in maybe uh, switching over to TREP, you should send us uh, send us your resume. You'll be seeing some official postings on those roles here in the next week or so. Um, but we'd love to get a, a early head start. Feel free to send us over your uh, qualifications and uh, we'll put you in the queue. And I know we've been watching a lot of football. There was a lot of football last weekend. We're gearing up for more championship games this weekend. But did you guys see kind of the fun parts of it? Like the NFL players jumping around with their shirts off and drinking beer? <laughs> Absolutely. So our, uh, our our favorite celebrity, Taylor Swift, and I mean, who knows if that marriage is in the works, but maybe soon to be brother-in-law, uh, chugging some beers, jumping into the stands, having a good old time. And then my personal favorite part of this is wife saying, get your butt back in here. <laughs> yeah, it's so a couple of things you got to set the scene like the game's in buffalo it's crazy cold there's snow everywhere they shovel it out he in the pregame is like doing all the local buffalo traditions like jumping on tables drinking beer out of bowling balls like from just some random fans then at the game jumps out of the booth chugs more beers i read today he drank 40 miller lights or something <laughs> Um, I thought the coolest part was there was a girl there with the sign that wanted to talk to Taylor Swift or whatever, and he kind of like lifted her up so she could get a wave in or whatever. But um, I would say maybe we would try to match that here at Trap, but like I would probably be able to slam like two and a half beers and then it would be over. Um, so I can live vicariously through uh, through Jason Kelsey, I guess. Our company is having a ping pong tournament happy hour right now, so we'll have to find out how many beers were consumed at that tournament. Probably not uh, something that'll make the cut next time, but uh, yeah, yeah there, there's uh, we like to have fun at Trap, and uh, you know, just a plug for the company that we we do a lot of really cool employee stuff like that, ping pong tournaments, basketball papa shot stuff, cornhole in the summertime on the terrace. I mean, like a lot of really cool things here at the company. And a last minute shout out for some inside baseball for those listening. We have a colleague Jen listening in today. And she's a big Swifty, so we'll give her the shout out because she's the one that probably knows the ins and outs about this stuff. And with that, we'll close. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or just a comment, send an email to podcast.trip.com and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.